Part One, Chapter Eleven A of The Adventures of Jimmy Dale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Jimmy Dale by Frank L. Packard. Reading by Roger Moline. Part One The Man in the Case. Chapter Eleven A The Stool Pigeon. In the subway, ten minutes before, a freckle-faced messenger boy had squeezed himself into a seat beside Jimmy Dale, yanked a dime novel from a refractory pocket, and, blissfully lost to all the world, had buried his head in its pages. Jimmy Dale's glance at the youngster had equally perforce embraced the lurid title of the thriller, Dicing with Death, so imperturbably thrust under his nose. At the time he had smiled indulgently, but now, as he left the subway and headed for his home on Riverside Drive, the words not only refused to be ignored, but had resolved themselves into a curiously persistent refrain in his mind. They were exactly what they purported to be, dime novelish, of the deepest hue of yellow, melodramatic in the extreme, but also, to him now, they were grimly apt and premonitorily appropriate. Dicing with death. There was not an hour, not a moment in his day, when he was not literally dicing with death. When, with the underworld and the police allied against him, a single false move would lose him the throw that left death the winner. The risk of the dual life enforced upon him grew daily greater, and in the end there must be the reckoning. He would have been a madman to have shut his eyes in the face of what was obvious but it was worth it all, and in his soul he knew that he would not have had it otherwise, even now. Tonight, tomorrow, the day after, would come another letter from the Tocsin, and there would be another crime of the Gray Seals blazoned in the press. Would that be the last affair, or would there be another? Or tonight, tomorrow, the day after, would he be trapped before even one more letter came? He shrugged his shoulders as he ran up the steps of his house. Those were the stakes that he himself had laid on the table to wager upon the game. He had no quarrel there. But if only, before the end came, or even with the end itself, he could find her. With his latchkey he let himself into the spacious, richly furnished, well-lighted reception hall, and crossing this went up the broad staircase his steps noiseless on the heavy carpet. Below, faintly, he could hear some of the servants. They evidently had not heard him close the door behind him. Discipline was relaxed somewhat, it was quite apparent, with Jason, that peer of butlers, away. Jason, poor chap, was in the hospital. Typhoid they had thought it at first, though it had turned out to be some milder form of infection. He would be back in a few days now, but meanwhile he missed the old man sorely from the house. He reached the landing, and, turning, went along the hall to the door of his own particular den, opened the door, closed it behind him, and in an instant the keen, agile brain, trained to the littlest things that never escaped it, that daily held his life in the balance, was alert. The room was unusually dark, even for nighttime. It was as though the window shades had been closely drawn, a thing Jason never did. But then Jason wasn't there. Jimmy Dale, smiling then a little quizzically at himself, reached up for the electric light switch beside the door, pressed it, and his finger still on the button whipped his automatic from his pocket with his other hand. The room was still in darkness. The smile on Jimmy Dale's lips was gone for his lips now had closed together in a tight, drawn line. The lights in the rest of the house, as witnessed the reception hall, were in order. This was no accident. Silent, motionless, he stood there, listening. Was he trapped at last in his own house? By whom? The police? The thugs of the underworld? It made little difference. The end would differ only in the method by which it was attained. What was that? Was there a slight stir, a movement at the lower end of the room? 
or was it his imagination? His hand fell from the electric light switch to the doorknob behind his back. Slowly, without a sound, it began to turn under his slim, tapering fingers, whose deft, sensitive touch had made him known and feared as the master cracksman of them all. And, as noiselessly, the door began to open. It was like a duel, a duel of silence. What was the intruder, whoever he might be, waiting for? The abortive click of the electric light switch, to say nothing of the opening of the door when he had entered, was evidence enough that he was there. Was the other trying to place him exactly through the darkness to make sure of his attack? The door was open now, and suddenly Jimmy Dale laughed easily aloud and on the instant shifted his position. Well inquired Jimmy Dale coolly from the other side of the threshold. It seemed like a long-drawn sigh fluttering through the room, a gasp of relief. And then the blood was pounding madly at his temples, and he was back in the room again, the door closed once more behind him. Oh, Jimmy, why didn't you speak? I had to be sure that it was you. It was her voice. Hers. The toxin. Here. She was here, here in his house. You, he cried, you, here. He was pressing the electric light switch frantically again and again. Her voice came out of the darkness from across the room. Why are you doing that, Jimmy? You know already that I have turned off the lights. At the sockets, of course, he laughed out the words almost hysterically. Your face, I have never seen your face, you know. He was moving quickly toward the reading lamp on his desk. There was a quick, hurried swish of garments, and she was blocking his way. No, she said in a low voice. You must not light that lamp. He laughed again, shortly, fiercely now. She was close to him. His hands reached out for her, touched her, and thrilling at the touch, swept her toward him. Jimmy, Jimmy, are you mad? she breathed. Mad. Yes, he was mad with the wildest, most passionate exhilaration he had ever known. He found his voice with an effort. These months and years that I have tried until my soul was sick to find you, he cried out. And you are here now. Your face. I must see your face. She had wrenched herself away from him. He could hear her breath coming sharply in little gasps. He groped his way onward toward the desk. Wait! Her tones seemed to ring suddenly vibrant through the room. Wait, before you touch that lamp. I... I put you on your honor not to light it. He stopped abruptly. My honor? He repeated mechanically. Yes, I came here tonight because there was no other way. No other way. Do you understand? I came, trusting to your honor not to take advantage of the conditions that forced me to do this. I had no fear that I was wrong. I have no fear now. You will not light that lamp, and you will not make any attempt to prevent my going away, as I came, unknown. Is there any question about it, Jimmy? I am in your house. You don't know what you're saying he burst out wildly. I've risked my life for a chance like this again and again. I've gone through hell, living in squalor for a month on end as Larry the Bat in the hope that I might discover who you are. And do you think I'll let anything stop me now? I tell you, no. A thousand times, no. She made no answer. There was only her low, quick breathing coming from somewhere near him. He made another step toward the lamp and stopped. I tell you no, he said again, and took another step forward and stopped once more. Still she made no answer. A minute passed, another. His hand lifted and swept across his forehead in an agitated way. Still silence. She neither moved nor spoke. His hands dropped slowly to his side. There was a queer, twisted smile upon his lips. You win, 
he said hoarsely. Thank you, Jimmy, she said simply. And your name, who you are, he was speaking, but he did not seem to recognize his own voice. The hundred other things I've sworn I'd make you explain when I found you are all taboo as well, I suppose. Yes, she said. He laughed bitterly. Don't you know, he cried out, that between the police and the underworld, our house of cards is likely to collapse at any minute, that they are hunting the gray seal day and night. It is to be always like this, that I am never to know until it is too late. She came toward him out of the darkness impulsively. They will never get you, Jimmy, she said in a suppressed voice. And some day, I promise you now, you shall have your reward for tonight. You shall know everything. When? The word came from him with fierce eagerness. I do not know, she answered gently. Soon, perhaps, perhaps sooner than either of us imagine. And by that you mean what? He asked, and his hand reached out for her again through the blackness. This time she did not draw away. There was an instant's hesitation. Then she spoke again, hurriedly, a note of anxiety in her voice. You are beginning all over again, aren't you, Jimmy? And I have told you that tonight I can explain nothing. And besides, it is what has brought me here that counts now, and every moment is of... Yes, I know, he interposed. But then at least you will tell me one thing. Why did you come tonight, instead of sending me a letter as you always have before? Because it is different tonight than it ever was before, she replied earnestly. Because there is something in what has happened that I cannot explain myself. Because there is danger, and where I could not see clearly I feared a trap, and so I dared not send what, in a letter, could at best be only vague and incomplete details. Do you see? Yes, said Jimmy Dale, but he was only listening in an abstracted way. If he could only see that face so close to his. He had yearned for that with all his soul for years now, and she was here, standing beside him, and his hand was upon her arm, and here, in his own den, in his own house, he was listening to another call to arms for the gray seal from her own lips. Honor. Was he but a poor, quixotic fool? He had only to step to the desk and switch on the light. Why should... He steadied himself with a jerk and drew away his hand. She was in his house. Go on, he said tersely. Do you know, or did you ever hear of old Luther Doyle? She asked. No, said Jimmy Dale. Do you know a man, then, named Connie Myers? Connie Myers. Who in the Badlands did not know Connie Myers, who boasted of the half-dozen prison sentences already to his credit? Yes, he knew Connie Myers. But strangely enough, it was not in the Badlands, or as Larry the Bat, that he knew the man, or that the other knew him. It was as Jimmy Dale. Connie Myers had introduced himself one night several years ago with a blackjack that had just missed its mark as the man had jumped out from a dark hallway in the east side, and he, Jimmy Dale, had thrashed the other to within an inch of his life. He had reason to know Connie Myers, and Connie Myers had reason to remember him. Yes, he said with a grim smile, I know Connie Myers. And the tenement across the street from where you live as Larry the Bat? That, of course, you know. He leaned toward her wonderingly now. Of course, he ejaculated. Naturally. Listen, then, Jimmy. She was speaking quickly now. It is a strange story. This Luther Doyle was already over fifty when, some eight or nine years ago, his parents died within a few months of each other, and he inherited somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred thousand dollars. But the man, though harmless enough, was mildly insane, half-witted, queer, 
and the old couple, on account of their son's mental defects, took care to leave the money securely invested, and so that he could only touch the interest. During these eight or nine years he has lived by himself in the same old family house where he had lived with his parents, in a lonely spot near Pelham. And he has lived in a most frugal, even miserly manner. His income could not have been less than six thousand dollars a year, and his expenditures could not have been more than six hundred. His dementia, ironically enough, from the day that he came into his fortune, took the form of a most pitiable, and abject fear that he would die in poverty, misery, and want. And so, year after year, cashing his checks as fast as he got them, never trusting the bank with a penny, he kept hiding away somewhere in his house every cent he could scrape and save from his income, which today must amount, at a minimum calculation, to fifty thousand dollars. And, observed Jimmy Dale quietly, Connie Myers robbed him of it, and, no, her voice was quivering with passion as she caught up his words. Twice in the last month, Connie Myers tried to rob him, but the money was too securely hidden. Twice he broke into Doyle's house when the old man was out, but on both occasions was unsuccessful in his search, and was interrupted and forced to make his escape on account of Doyle's return. Tonight, an hour ago, in an empty house on the second floor of that tenement, in the room facing the landing, old Luther Doyle was murdered. There was silence for an instant. Her hand had closed in a tight pressure on his arm. The darkness seemed to add a sort of ghastly significance to her words. In God's name, how do you know all this? he demanded wildly. How do you know all these things? "'Does that matter now?' she answered tensely. "'You will know that when you know the rest. "'Oh, don't you understand, Jimmy? "'There is not a moment to lose now. "'It was easy to lure a half-witted creature like that anywhere. "'It was Connie Myers who lured him to the tenement "'and murdered him there. "'But from that point, Jimmy, I am not sure of our ground. "'I do not know whether Connie Myers is alone in this or not. But I do know that he is going to Doyle's house again tonight to make another search for the money. There is no question but that old Doyle was murdered to give Connie Myers and his accomplices, if there are any, a chance to tear the house inside out to find the money, to give them the whole night to work in without interruption, if necessary. But Doyle, dead in his own house, could have interfered no more with them than Doyle dead in that tenement. Why was he lured to the tenement by Connie Myers when he could much more easily have been put out of the way in his own house? Jimmy, there is something behind this, something more that you must find out. There may be others in this besides Connie Myers. I do not know. But there is something here that I am afraid of. Jimmy, you must get that man. You must get the others if there are others and you must stop them from getting the money in that house tonight. Do you understand now why I have come here? I could not explain in a letter. I do not quite seem to be explaining now. It would seem as though there were no need for the gray seal, that simply the police should be notified. But I know, Jimmy, call it intuition, what you will, I know that there is need for us, for you, tonight that behind all this is a tragedy, deeper, blacker than even the brutal, cold-blooded murder that is already done. Her voice, in its passionate earnestness, died away, and an anger, cold, grim, remorseless, settled upon Jimmy Dale, settled as it always settled upon him at her call to arms. His brain was already at work in its quick, instant way, probing, sifting, planning, she was right. It was strange. It was more than strange that, with the added risk, the danger, the difficulty, the man should have been brought miles to be done away with in that tenement. Why? Connie Myers took form before him, the coarse features, the tawny hair that straggled across the low forehead, the shifty eyes that were an intermediate color between brown and gray, 
the thin lips that seemed to draw in and give the jaw a protruding, belligerent effect. And Connie Myers knew him as Jimmy Dale. It would have to be, then, as Larry the Bat, that the Gray Seal must work. That meant time to go to the sanctuary and change. The police, he asked suddenly aloud, they have not yet discovered the body? Not yet, she replied hurriedly. And that is still another reason for haste. There is no telling when they will. See, here, she thrust a paper into his hand. Here is a plan of old Doyle's house and directions for finding it. You must get Connie Myers red-handed. You must make him convict himself, for the evidence through which I know him to be guilty can never be used against him. And, Jimmy, be careful. I know I am not wrong, that there is still something more behind all this. And now go, Jimmy, go. There is no time to lose. She was pushing him across the room toward the door. Go. The word seemed suddenly to bring dismay. It was she again who was dominant now in his mind. Who knew if tonight, when he was taking his life in his hands again, would not be the last, and she was here now, here beside him, where she might never be again. She seemed to divine his thoughts, for she spoke again, a strange new note of tenderness in her voice that thrilled him. You must never let them get you, Jimmy, for my sake. It will not last much longer, it is near the end, and I shall keep my promise. But go, now, Jimmy, go. Go, he repeated numbly. Go? But, but you? I, she slipped suddenly away from him, retreating back down the room. I will go as I came. Wait, listen, he pleaded. There was no answer. She was there, somewhere back there in the darkness still. He stood hesitant at the door. It seemed that every faculty he possessed urged him back there again, to her. Could he let her escape him now, when she was so utterly in his power, she who meant everything in his life? And then, like a cold shock, came that other thought, she who had trusted to his honor. With a jerk, his hand swept out, felt for the doorknob, and closed upon it. Good night he said heavily, and stepped out into the hall. End of Part 1, Chapter 11a Reading by Roger Moline